So this is the fifth in a series that I'm doing on harmony, which I thought was a good topic given we've got these lovely music festival students coming and, and playing. But we're looking at harmony in a sort of a greater level, really. Harmony technically is the sound of things that go together well. This is, this is a, a summation of where we've got to at the moment. People singing in harmony, in tune with each other, we, we understand that as harmony. But in psychological terms, harmony is a positive state of inner peace, calmness, balance, a feeling of being in tune with the world. And over the last few weeks, we've looked at the idea that in order to create harmony in our lives, we have to create harmony within ourselves, a yeah, our relationship between our minds and our bodies. We have to experience, we can't bring harmony into the world unless we're really experiencing harmony ourselves. And to do that, we have to identify, as Heather was doing, that point within ourselves that puts everything into balance, that still point, like in a gyroscope that goes around, there's a still point within ourselves where we connect. And we have to really identify with that, which is where spiritual practice comes in, whether it be a quiet time or a meditation or walking in the mountains or time on the cushion, that peace doesn't just come, that peace within us. We have to look at creating it. And you have to get yourself in the game, really, by putting your spiritual sails up and letting the wind come and enable you to create that path towards harmony. Perceiving, as Einstein's idea of God, one who reveals himself in the harmony of all that exists. God being one who reveals himself in the harmony of all that exists. Because one thing we have to realize is, is that despite what we all witness every day on television, harmony is the state that the universe, the cosmos, continues to exist in. The world is ordered. So in a sense, we have to have that perception of the world being ordered. And when you look at it just as the atoms are in order and move in an orderly fashion to give us this space. So the whole universe, the planets, every, there is an order, there is a harmony that exists there. And our role, really, is to join with that harmony, to become part of the harmony that is at the centre of all things. We have to become part of the, the harmony of all that exists. We have to become part of God. That's... That's our role, really. Um, and last week, we looked at how we connect from the harmony of our bodies to the harmony of the present moment, really using the present moment almost as a control panel to make a difference in the world around us and to bring harmony into that world. And if you've uh, missed any of those sessions, the, the little red card in front of you in the chair, you'll be able to find out how to get uh, previous sessions. And if you want to be in our mailing list, uh, the blue card, you can fill that in and put it in the plate um, and just let us know if you'd like to be on our mailing list. <coughs> so gradually we're making a progression from the harmony that exists within us the harmony that gives us life, to the deep harmony that exists all around us, the harmony of the planets and the earth, of the atoms, and the harmony of everything that makes all of that up. But of course, then we have to deal with the knotty problem of the disharmony that we experience in our lives every day, all the time, on the television. We're beset by those storms that don't seem very harmonious. How do we practically make a harmonious connection with all that's around us when there seems to be all the disharmony that we have to deal with? And I'm going to deal with this question in two parts. This week, I'm going to look at how we make that connection, how we engage with life, how we, how we get on the roller coaster of life without getting thrown off. And next week, I'm going to look at how we deal with disharmony, how we deal with the actual experience, the reality of the disharmony that exists. And I think that in the reading that Bruce read today, Jesus gave us a steer as to how we make that connection, 
with the harmony of everything that's around us. The reading, if you, for those of you who didn't recognize it, comes when Jesus visits the pool at Bethsaida and he's just healed somebody who went down into that pool every day for 38 years. And he, that's the famous moment where he says, take up their bed and walk. That's that particular moment. And the Pharisees and all the teachers of the law are all incensed. They say, you know, for this reason they tried to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father and making himself equal to God. So there's a whole stuff going on there. And, and he gives that answer to the Pharisees who say, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. He says, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so you'll be amazed. So what Jesus is saying here is he does things by reading the weather. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm doing this stuff by reading the weather. He sees what the Father is doing, and he does the same. In other words, he's able to see into the deep harmony that's going on and simply joins in with that harmony and becomes a part of it. You know, that quote I had from Einstein, he was asked by Rabbi Goldstein whether he believed in God, and he responded, I believe not in a God who concerns himself with the fate and the doings of mankind, but in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the harmony of all that exists. And what Jesus is saying here is he's saying that he is able to see God in the harmony of what is existing in front of him, and he does what he sees the Father doing. And that, I think, is the steer as to how to connect with harmony. Last week I mentioned Jan Garrett, who said that the rules of harmony are, number one, and you can tell me if you agree with this, I'm sure you do, number one, tune your instrument, number two, show up, number three, know the song, number four, listen, and number five, play well with others. That's the sort of musical harmony thing. So tuning your instrument is being in touch with your body. Showing up is being in the present moment. Knowing the song is being aware that our purpose in life is to bring harmony. That's the song. We know that's what we're doing. And this bit is listening and playing well with others. So in connecting, what you do is you look up and you you read the weather of what's wanting to happen in order to bring harmony about. When I was young, believe it or not, I had a really good treble voice. I was in the choir and sang a great deal, and my greatest embarrassment in life was was winning the unbroken voice singing competition at the age of 16. (laughs) And they all thought that was marvelous, but I had to go and receive this award that my voice is still not broken at the age of, of 16. My only problem was that I couldn't sing in harmony. I always wanted to sing the melody. I always had to sing the unison. And I found it so difficult to sing in harmony in support of someone else's melody. I tended, you know, that's how I really lived my life. I tended to, you know, live it pretty selfishly. Not really being able to hear. It was symptomatic of what, you know, as many young people are, I I was reluctant to play to someone else's tune. And, you know, this is something, as my wife will tell you, I've been working on all my life. (laughs) You have to be able to listen to others and to be harmonious in order to really play with others. You have to see what the Father's doing in your life in order to be able to participate in a harmonious way. You You have to see what the program is and then you have to get with the program. That's really how to live in a harmonious way. And of course, the first thing that throws up is that it goes against our natural inclination. And our natural inclination is to make up the game in our head, 
make up the program in our head and then make that program happen all around us. We think, this is what it ought to be like. I'm going to make sure everybody else does this way because I know I'm right. We often think that we know what the right thing is to do and then we not only have to try and have that happen, but we try also to make others get with whatever program that we're selling. That is the basis of much religion. They come up with a program and they want everybody else to get with that particular program. And what I'm suggesting here is the reverse of that. It's to get ourselves out of the way, to hold lightly our wishes and desires, and to have some equanimity about what happens to us, and to take the road we discern is the road of harmony, to see what direction the spiritual wind is blowing, and to trim our sails according to that. And it involves a bit of self-sacrifice. I think we saw that last week with President Biden agonizing as to whether to drop out of the race or not. But I think he saw the way the wind was blowing. He saw that from his perspective, the way to act was to put his personal desires aside and to do what he thought was best for the country. We all face these things in our lives all the time. And each of us has to make that choice that Tom Hirsch was talking about last week, the choice to be part of the harmony or to forge our own way, even if it creates disharmony, because we think we're right. I faced it in my life many times. But more recently, um, I have a daughter, Sam, who used to be my son. Now, when your child comes to you and says, Dad, I feel that I want to identify as a woman, it's not easy. It's not something that really happened a great deal in my generation, you know. I mean, I didn't see many examples of that. But, but, you know, when you have that situation, you're faced with a choice. And the choice is that you either decide to insist that life is the way it's always been and that you know right from wrong and that you think that this is a mistake that needs to be confronted, blah, blah, blah. Or you see that there is a certain harmony in this and that the way of harmony is to see that this is how Sam wants to express herself, and that my role is to love her and to seek her happiness above all things. And, of course, it's not really a difficult decision to make, but had I gone the other way, I might have thought that I was right, but the disharmony that it would have created would have been unbearable. You know, that's not to say that you always just roll over when people come and say things to you that are against your views. It means that you have a role in seeing where the spiritual wind is blowing and trimming your sails accordingly. And you know, I think that can relate to anything. Your diet, for example. What can you see is the right way to live harmoniously in relationship to your diet and your body and how you express yourself? Maybe veganism is a more harmonious way to live. I'm not vegan, but it is something that I might consider. Or alcohol consumption. What is the harmonious way of alcohol consumption? Or sugar consumption? Are you able to look into this with clear eyes and and take a road of harmony. I think the same is true of of our relationship with the planet. There is what is convenient, and there is what is harmonious. And I think it's good to notice when we're choosing the road that's not harmonious, but one that makes our lives easier. And we often do that. Often we choose to ignore the harmonious option because it doesn't suit us. Uh, And then we wonder why we're experiencing disharmony. But it's in our relationship with other people, you know, that it becomes really stark. We often, I think, control others in order to suit our circumstances or also to control what others might think of us 
rather than seeing what the Father is doing and opting for the path of harmony. And I'm reading a book at the moment called uh, Moon in a Dew Dot by Zen master Dojin. And I came across, you know, he had this idea, and I think it, it, it completely relates to harmony. He has this idea that, that there are two minds that you need to bring on. He's a 13th century um, uh, Zen master. He, and he says there are two minds in order to create harmonious life that you need to bring on board. There is the kind mind, and there is the great mind. And this is like you know, the how-to of how you arrive at that. Now, the kind mind, we were talking about this in meditation the other day, the kind mind is the parental mind. Even poor, this is what he says, even poor or suffering people raise their children with deep love. Their hearts cannot be understood by others. They do not care whether they themselves are rich or poor. Their only concern is that their children will grow up. They pay no attention to whether they themselves are cold or hot, but cover their children to protect them from the cold or shield them from the hot sun. This is extreme kindness. Only those who have aroused this kind mind can know it, and only those who practice this kind mind can understand it. Therefore, you should look after the water and the grain and the rocks and everything with compassionate care as though tending your own children. In the development of our ability to see the harmony of life, we have to develop the kind mind, which means a mind that brings out deep love from within us and sees life from the perspective of that deep love. I think it echoes the Dalai Lama's aphorism. You know, Dalai Lama always asks, you know, what's his religion? He says, my religion is kindness. And when we see life from a kind perspective, a perspective that looks on all life as kin, family, that's where that word comes from, kin. It looks as life as family. Then we are doing what is most loving. James Finley, who was here last year, his famous phrase, all things considered, what is the most loving thing I can do? That that is the perspective of creating harmony. That that gives us that. And it immediately brings us into a place where we can act in a harmonious way, where we can treat all life as family, as kin, with kindness. So the first one is the kind mind. It's, It's that loving mind. It's treating everything as kin. And the second one is the great mind. To be fully harmonious, it also takes Zen Master Jojen's other concept of the great mind. The great mind is a mind like a great mountain or a great ocean. It does not have any partiality or exclusivity. No partiality, no exclusivity. The mountain doesn't care. The mountain doesn't decide whether you're good or bad. The mountain accepts you as you are. You shouldn't regard, for example, Zen Master Dojin says, in the, with the great mind, you shouldn't regard a pound as lighter or a ton as heavy. You shouldn't regard a pound as light or a ton as heavy. Do not be attracted by the sounds of a spring or take pleasure in seeing a spring garden. There is an equanimity about it. When you see the autumn colors, do not be partial to them. You should allow the four seasons to advance in one viewing and see an ounce as a pound with an equal eye. In this way, you should study and understand the meaning of great. I'm not sure how popular that will be with leaf peepers that come in the autumn. No, you shouldn't be looking at this. No, don't. But you get the idea that each thing, everything has its own particularity. No one thing is of greater value than any other thing. No one person is of greater value than any other person. No one species is of greater value than any other species. Everything has its own particularity of divine value. That's the truth of it. Everything has its own particularity of divine value. And the moment you start going, oh yes, that's beautiful, or that's ugly, you've created a particularity. Now, 
I, I know, you know, of course we like to hear the mountains. I'm not saying that one. But it's being aware of the development. Of, we, you do it so often. You know, th people that we like, things that we like, he's ugly, she's ugly, you know, you should, this is blah, 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 blah. It's about judging. The great mind is about having that equanimity about all things, of recognizing the particularity of the divine in all things. And seeing that no one, and literally it's true, no one thing has any greater value intrinsically than anything else. Every single atom has equal value. And we put the extra value on it. It's us that does it. It's the mind that does that. The great mind does not discriminate. It's not partial. It does not consider polarity as something to be valued. And the term great encompasses all events and circumstances. It doesn't favor one above the other. And in practical terms, that means our kindness is not particular. Our kindness is not particular. It's not partial. We do not consider the implications of our kindness on ourselves or on others. But we do what the universe is calling us to do. We act with equanimity. Incidentally, going back to the trans issue... I think that the emergence of gender fluidity has come as non-dualism has become a more per pervasive idea in the world, where the value of a defined polarity has become less important and people feel more able to exist within a spectrum of polarity. I think also, last page, so those of you who are panicking, also... The divisiveness that we see in politics and culture, where people seem to be clinging to one pole or another in an attempt to defend their identity, comes out of a fear of non-polar fluidity, where it's not black and white. As life becomes less defined, and we begin to see those shades of grey, people cling to the black and white out of a fear that something they hold dear will be lost. I always remember when I came here on an interview years ago, 10 years ago now, there was a 12-foot cross here. And in the interview, they said, now, what are you going to do with the cross? Because half the congregation wanted to get rid of it because they thought it was just too scary. And half the congregation thought they'd lose the Christianness of, uh, of, of the chapel if the cross wasn't there. So I sort of fudged the issue and came up with some non-committal response. But when I came here, I was confronted by a 12-foot cross. And I thought, Gosh, goodness me, and it was November. And then in December, what happens is when the chapel is decorated, the cross is taken away and put outside. And so the cross was put outside. And then after Christmas, I just didn't bring back the cross. And no one noticed, literally for six months. And it was almost the polarity. The whole issue around the cross was, you know, is it going to represent our Christianness? Or is it going to represent our, you know, well, we're not all that Christian. And actually, you know, we didn't need that. Luckily, you know, I'm able to represent Christians and non-Christians. And there was not the need for that polarity. And I think in the world, when we drop our polarities and when we let the shades of grey come up, then you know, it becomes richer. And, you know, the fear of losing something is why people cling to the black and white. And they, they count that aspect of their identity, the blackness or the whiteness, as being more important than including, than including the fluidity that others experience. So to some extent, I think our disharmony in life is a function of the emergence of a new harmony, that scares the bejesus out of many people. But more about that next week. This week is about connecting to the harmony around us and by seeing what the Father is doing and doing likewise. And to do so, what we have to do is we have to see what the Spirit is doing. We have to cultivate the kind mind that brings love and the great mind that brings impartiality. And we have to have the ability to do that and therefore to go with what we see needs to be done. And you know, it's not rocket science. It means prioritizing the good of the whole above our own ideas of right and wrong, of good and bad. We have to let go of our precious ideas and opinions 
and look for the harmonious approach. We have to be conscious of our desire to be right, our desire to control, and we have to see what will create that harmony. In this way, we connect with harmony. We bring harmony into the world through the way we connect with what's going on around us. And next week, I'll just want to address directly that disharmony. So we always like to give people an opportunity to come back at, uh, at um, what's been said here. If you want to either ask a question, disagree, share an experience, uh, or just be silent, we just give a little moment for people to put their hands up if they want to. Tom. Um, I have not fully formed thoughts, but uh, to think out loud a bit, the reading about the Father and the Son, if I hear it in a traditional sense, it doesn't fully connect, but if I um, translate, into, translate the Father into the, the universe, the cosmos, the Son into um, representation of us as individuals, and the I guess it would be the, the option to choose harmony of how to co-create within the universe um, to create, uh, to, to where to find full self-expression in the options that one chooses is maybe living life skillfully, as you would say. Yeah. And uh, so it really helped to sort of percolate within, refilter it, re-understand it in a way that I could make it make sense uh, without the traditional overlay. Yeah. And in that sense, it's very freeing, it's very liberating, um, and allowing of options that uh, within full self-expression, there are lots of choices of how to create and co-create within the harmony that you can see. I guess consciousness may be the moment you see those patterns and then choose. Thank you, Tom. That was absolutely lovely. Appreciate that. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes. Susan. I think that sermon should be read at the inauguration no matter who wins. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's great. Thank you, Susan. Yes, and Bruce. Marcus Aurelius in Meditations does have some little concept where he says, you know, you have plans, but obstacles are going to be there. They just they are. So the obstacle obstacle becomes the new way. And to me, it suggests a little bit of a, a dynamic uh, sort of co-creative uh, effort. Not that, you know, two opposing forces might be equally equipped to sort of Oh, yeah, let's, let's make one plus one equal ten type of thing, as opposed to, no, I just want to hang on to what I want to hang on to. So I was just curious if you had any sort of thoughts about that. that you know, and he, he's dealing in a very politically, you know, a militarily, you know, chaotic time. A lot of disharmony there. So, uh, you know, how, how, how do we sort of, you know, sort of redesign and, and build it forward? Well, I'm reading Marcus Aurelius at the moment, Meditations, after I watched The Holdovers. Uh, anyone seen The Holdovers here? The guy in there gives out uh, Marcus Aurelius to everybody. So I'm halfway through it, but I haven't come to that passage. Had I come to it, I'd have used it this week. But, uh, but no, I, th I think, uh, you know, do you know, I always like to think, you know, in the, in the chapel here, that the whole spiritual thing is that the recognition that each individual is in the driving seat of their own spiritual lives that we're all in the driving seat, and that we just try and take the best we can from around us to work out, as we were saying, how to live life more skillfully. And I think taking the ownership of being in the driving seat of the spiritual life, of your life, and, and steering it, rather than let yourself be sort of flood down the river like you know, a, a small orange duck, you know, to actually <laughs> drive one's life is the most important thing. And uh, that's what I would, I would suggest, I think. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, we have always... One more, uh, one more here. Oh, one more. Yeah, so was, I didn't see that. Tracy, how nice uh, that you're piping up. I was just thinking that now is the um, Olympics, and you see so many national teams that are 
mostly have trained in America, they identified with their colleges and being American, now they're back playing for their home countries. So it's kind of a, just a, a transition of identification and finding a new harmony within that. I mean, for the love of the sport yeah. or, so I just was, that just sort of came to my mind. I'm so glad you said that because, you know, when I was watching the speech that the guy was giving who was the head of the Olympic, I mean, you know, I think it's such an inspiring thing, isn't it? You've got 200 and something countries. All kind, in the old days, war stopped when the Olympics happened. You know, the only time it didn't was when the Spartans decided not to go to the Olympics and held with the 300. That was the only time. The rest of the time, all wars stopped. They went and did their Olympic Games, came back and started their wars again. And there is something incredibly inspiring, isn't there, about every, the world coming together for excellence. And I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because there is an aspect of harmony you can see in action. You know, and people accept when they win or lose. They go for it in different ways. They, they, you know, I was always loved. Did you see, I was watching the swimming last night and seeing the competitors congratulate each other who came first, second, and third. It was fantastic, wasn't it? Just that harmony that exists there. Perfect thing to say.